I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare In the Trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm joined by my good friend Scott Rosenberg, whose career spans every genre, comedy, action, horror. His credits include the scripts for Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead, High Fidelity, Con Air, and Beautiful Girls. It's a pleasure to have you, Scott. Thanks for being nice here. Nice to see you, Mike. So we'll start off with, with something really substantive. Tell, what's about, what happened with the knife fight? The, the knife fight? The knife fight. The knife fight. The wow. knife fight is an urban legend. It's circulated around town. We heard you were involved in an altercation. We were, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can no longer drink in the bars in North Carolina, actually, because of that. We were shoot, I was doing this uh, uh, TV show for Showtime called Going to California. And I was down there, and uh, Vince Vaughn and Steve Buscemi were down there, too. They were doing a movie, and uh, I know those guys. And they called me up and they said, hey, come out and let's have a drink. And we went out to have a drink and then we wound up in this bar. And I don't know, I'm sure you've been out with famous people before. It was, it was the most incredible thing. Like all the, all the kids recognized the, the famous people and they were all asking for autographs and it was all love and happiness and joy. And then one guy thought his girlfriend was over talking to the famous people for too long. And I just saw like the, the momentum, because I wasn't famous, I was right. unrecognizable. The momentum shift and all of a sudden it just, the mob turned. Does it just go dark at a certain Yeah, time? it's like all those people who were like, you know, I love Steve Buscemi, but you know what? When I went up and talked to him, he really wasn't as nice to me as he could have been. So it just, even though he was, and it just shifted. And in two seconds, it was, we, we were, we were in a, a huge fight. We were basically attacked by the entire bar. Cops not, showed up, pepper sprayed. I was blind and handcuffed in the middle of the road. Which should not happen to writers. <laughs> On my, well, you know, I'm, I'm always right. you know, that guy trying to change right. the, the, uh, the perception of writers in right. Hollywood. I think that they were all low functioning nerds. Uh, it, was, it was really bad. And, 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 but the whole, the, 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 the punchline was, at the time it was before Vince kind of blew up. And Steve was just a very you know, well-known character actor, but it wasn't like I was with you know, George Clooney and Brad Pitt. So I called my, my, my brother and I was like, listen, whatever you do, like, don't tell Ma, she doesn't need to know. And I called my girlfriend at the time, and I was like, don't tell your parents. And, and cut to, it had to be the slowest news story of, of, the, of the week because my mugshot was, it was even on CNN in, in like Rome. Can like you my, the numbers on My buddy was in Italy, and, and he couldn't speak Italian, but he just saw my face on the, on the thing. And, and he was like, what did Rosenberg do? Did he shoot the president or something? It was like, you know, that kind of thing. Right. But, uh, but that was it, but it was good. But, and then Aaron Sorkin got arrested for like smuggling mushrooms to Vegas. <laughs> so it took the you know, sh focus off. Shifted completely, so it was nice. So All I thank Aaron for that. <laughs> <laughs> Are things like that ever fodder for your screenplays? Did, you ever, did that inspire you down the um, line? I'll tell you, it, it, I mean, no. Um, you liked it. I'd like to say that I would be a lot more like it, like it was like 9-11, like after 9-11, we all had that quick period of time where we were like, we can't blow shit up and we can't do, which we all regrettably got over really quickly, but there was that moment where I was like, maybe, you know what, violence is, violence is bad, and maybe I'm too cavalier about the way that I, you know, I'm, I'm quick to introduce a knife or a gun into a screenplay, but at the end of the day, no. How much of your work uh, do you find is drawn from real life experiences or just things you go through in, in everyday life as opposed to just sitting at the computer and making things up out of whole cloth? Everything, to, for it to be true, it needs to at least come, I mean, even if, even if you're doing, you know, I, I never went to prison, I mean, except for that time. I've been arrested <laughs> a number of times, but I never did right. a hard time. But at the end of the day, like an example, like let's bring up that classic Con Air. You know, I, I was not a prisoner. I, I actually spent a lot of time with them. I did my research. But for me to be able to write that truthfully, you had to, you had to come, you had to find some way in, in which my way in was this is a guy who is just trying to get home. And that is definitely something that I felt before, you know, just trying to get home. He, in this case, he was trying to get home to see his child that he didn't know he had, or that he knew he had that he'd never seen. And so you just sort of find that, that, that emotional honesty, and then you, if, you, if you can refract that through the sort of Jerry Bruckheimer lens, then you're, I think then, you can, then you're okay. Right. Now you worked on a lot of big, you know, action uh, pictures, uh, and even in your pictures that are just about people, they're very cinematic. Do you, do you think in visuals or pictures before you write? Does it, do, the, do the thoughts come to you in, in visual ways? Um, I, I, I really, I mean, I, th I think I, th yes, I do. But at the same time, my, I, the stuff that I'm most interested, it's all about the people and it's all about what they say. I'm, I'm a big proponent of the plot is for pussies uh, school of, of thinking, you know. Um, I've gotten better at it. Uh, I love a good story and a good idea as much as the next guy, but at the end of the day, what's most important to me, my way in initially, is who are these guys and what do they want? Okay, you know? so you start from a character standpoint. Absolutely, yeah. Do you, uh, do you outline before you, you go to draft? Uh-huh. Basically, the, 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 the drill is 
come up with an idea um, and immediately figure out who, who is who people it, who's, who, who's the main character, who's, you know, and then like live with that for, for like drive with it. And it's the first thing I think about when I wake up and it's the first thing I think about when I go to sleep and you take it to dinner, you just kind of marinate it. Right. And this is the cast of characters that and are coming the, together the in your head. The cast of characters and the story and okay. where it's going to go. And I love coming up with sort of what's the opening scene, you know, what is mm -hmm. that opening scene? Um, and I always, it's really, I always say, you know, what separates the men from the boys is because everybody can write the first 25 pages right. of a screenplay. And I think everybody can write the last 20. You know, it's, it's page 71 when you're mired in the muck, which it makes perfect sense. When you go to the movies, it's always like around an hour and five minutes where you're like looking at your watch and you're right. like, um, but I just spend a lot of time with it and that can go on from, you know, six to eight weeks, whatever. And then at a certain point when I feel ready, I'll sit down, legal pad, and I'll just write one through 70 and just do the single line. A single line per scene? Single line, yeah, just not, not tremendously detailed, just knowing, right. you know, Jimmy walks into the restaurant Da, 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 da. He meets him. and then knowing where the acts end, basically. But and then, and then that list is constantly being reworked. And then at a certain point, you sit down and you start writing. And what's great about the list is you, I check off each scene as I go with a different pen from the one used before, so you get that sort of sense of completion. Like, ooh, I wrote six scenes today. Okay. And um, and I think that if you if your outline is solid, um, it shouldn't take you. Like I, I have friends, man. <laughs> I wish I was like it. It's really romantic, that sort of like Philip Roth idea or John Updike of like laboring forever over a single sentence, you know? Like I wish I could be that guy, but I'm just not. And at the end of the day, it's a screenplay and a screenplay is a only should be about 110, 120 pages. Most of it white, by the way. Right. So these people that spend a year, I just think it's crazy. As long as you can write dialogue. I think a lot of people who can't write dialogue tend to, it, it will take longer because they're constantly doubting themselves. So yeah. you, you go from the beat sheet, as it were, the w one line per, per scene, directly into screenplay. There's yes. no like treatment step. Or, no treatment. Right. No, um, no index cards. Like right. Again, like, I, I wish I was that guy. Like, that sounds really cool to me, but I just don't have that kind of mind, which is why most of my scripts are <laughs> sloppily structured. <laughs> is the process different when you're working on a big studio picture like Con Air or Gone in 60 Seconds as opposed to you know, the more character-based films like Beautiful Girls and High Fidelity and things to do in Denver? <clears throat> Well, I mean, you know, they're different just because of the nature of the very beast. I mean, there, there's, you don't have to be so slavish about hitting act, you know, act outs right. in, in, uh, in, the, in the smaller movies. I mean, you sort of have to know them, but at the end of the day, it's not. And of course, obviously, you know, people are going to be, breathe, people by people, I mean, producers and studio executives are going to be breathing down your neck a hell of a lot more um, when, it's, when the movie costs $100 million than when it costs five. Right. It's just standard. And, uh, and, it, and it's, it, they're such different animals. It's like you can't even, I mean, the great thing is, is Denver and Beautiful Girls, particularly, um, High Fidelity went to a bunch of rewrites, but Denver and Beautiful Girls, basically we shot those, those scripts were shot. The, the, the ones that when I sat down, you know, all by myself, early on in my career, you know, in the room with just me and a bottle of Jack Daniels, um, it was, th th that's what we shot. Whereas Con Air, I personally wrote like, 50 drafts. Wow. Then other people came in and did their little thing, and then I came back in, and then it was crazy. I remember the last day of shooting, and the last day of shooting I was writing, and I remember sitting in uh, Bruckheimer's trailer to do my last, we were in like Ogden, Utah, like in the Salt Flats, middle of nowhere, and I finished my last, uh, my last, my last we were on like triple golden rock by that point, you know, like the, just right. crazy. And that's because production re production rewrites, each new revision is on a different colored different page. Different colored page, right. So by the time you're at double golden rod, you've gone through every color in yeah, the rainbow. Yeah, and they put on the cover, they put each um, color and the date of each color. And honestly, you couldn't see the, uh, you couldn't see the title Con Air because it was surrounded by all the, all the, all all the, the colors. All the dates. Right. But, um, and I said, and I finished this last scene and I said to Jerry, I go, that's it. It's the very last writing on Con Air ever. And he just looked at me, he goes, are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> I was like, what? He goes, you'll be writing this thing for the next three months. And it was true, because in post, in ADR, and like, da, 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 like it's just on that kind of movie, because it's the, it, it stands to reason, it's the only thing they can constantly be tinkering with is the script. You're right. spending $100 million, nobody can sleep at night unless, I mean, you can't like switch out Nick Cage. Sure. You can't switch out your director. You know, not in day 50. You can't switch out your location. You can't, but what you can constantly tinker with is, is the script, and that's what they do. 
do you find any common ground between working on the big pictures and working on the small pictures, uh, writing-wise, in terms of your process? Well, I mean, it, it's, it, they're very different. I mean, you have to sort of, I think you have to be emotionally invested to do good work either way. But a lot of times, because um, people always ask me, like, certainly on Gone in 60 Seconds and, and, uh, and the Kangaroo movie and some of the other bigger ones. Um, would that be Kangaroo Jack? That would be Kangaroo Jack, Mike. Thanks <laughs> Which, for Which, by the way, thanks. grossed $125 million oh, yeah, domestic. It was, quite, it, was quite a, it was quite a hit, but it, it wasn't, um, it was very different from what we sure, tried, sure. started out with. It was actually a hippo in it now. Um, <laughs> But um, most of these movies are not, you know, the story of the Rosenbergs coming over from the old country. You know, if, they, if, they, if it was that, like, that would freak me out. Sure. But, but we all know what it's about in that game. And, uh, the bigger picture game. The big, the big, the big $100 million movies. Mm -hmm. And every single person that has been, that has rewritten me, I've rewritten on something else. So it's a kind of weird, incestuous thing. Um, but on Arm Armageddon was the one that I, I it just always stands out because that was one of the ones I actually enjoyed. Um, and I was the ninth person out of nine. That's and, like a Catholic family. And, um, I, and uh, I, did, I didn't want to do it. It was crazy. And they I threw, threw, threw so much money at me because they were already in production. They were, it was like the fourth week of production. Oh, so you came on during production? Uh huh. And then I did my thing. Um, and then I, I went away. And then they called me like in the sixth week of production. And they said, we need a love scene between Ben and Liv. And I'm going to tell the story to illustrate the, the, the joys of, of the rewrite game, <laughs> which are not myriad, but this is one of them. Um, so I was like, I, 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 I'm doing something else. I, mean, I can't do it. And, and Jerry Brockheimer, the producer, and Michael Bay, the director, were calling me all the time. You got to come up with something. You got to come up with something. So, and they were shooting the next day. Oh, my God. Um, because I think I avoided their phone call for like four days. And it was the next day, and I said, okay, I'll whip something up. And um, I had dated this girl. Um, we had since broken up, but I dated her uh, about two months prior for years, for a couple of years. She was like my girlfriend. And this one night, I remember we were, we were in bed, and I was eating animal crackers. And I kind of did this thing with the animal crackers where I did basically like the you know, Discovery Channel with right. the animal crackers and the... And, and the <laughs> The cheetah was chasing the gazelle, and I, I took the gazelle and I actually, you know, made it look. The gazelle found a cave, you know, and the gazelle went and hid. And, hid. and so, now did she think it was? Uh, did she think it was as cute as Luke Tyler does on screen? Well, this is—it's very funny. No, she yeah. actually at the time. And, uh, she, I don't remember ca any cave diving at the on, on well, screen. You know, it's, it was PG-13. Okay. At the time, the girl actually said to me, "Do you think anybody else in the whole world is doing this very thing at this very same time?" She said that. So they asked me to do this thing. I'm literally, what the hell do I know about a love scene at this point in my life? This is during, you know, my wild years. You remember. While well, you had a girlfriend. You were there. <laughs> I mean, just the whole period. Okay. Um, and uh, I didn't know what to, so I, I just, I said, I'll write that scene. So I wrote that scene and I sent it to them and they loved it. They loved it, loved it, loved it. And, and what I did, it added in the scene is, yeah, they don't go the, you know, but, but she actually, full Liv monster. says, do you think anybody else is doing this very thing at this very same time? And Ben says, because it's the night before they're about to go say, you know, Ben looks up at her and he goes, I hope so. Otherwise, what the hell are we trying to save? Oh, nice. Which, you mm -hmm. know, was completely cheesy, but I didn't say that to my girlfriend because right. we weren't trying to save anything. <laughs> but the point of the story is they shoot it. Um, it, it, the girlfriend actually was completely furious when she went to see the movie. Oh, that you got was, in trouble? Oh, big time. Um, even, but, with the, even with an ending to the scene that that's, uh, that, that's and uplifting? I, told, I and, said it was an homage right. to our love, and she, didn't, she wasn't <laughs> buying that. But the point of the whole story, we can get it back into screenwriting, I promise, is when all the magazines did their year-end worst scene ever, ish, you know, in the Premier Magazine and Entertainment Weekly, number one on every single magazine was the Animal Crackers. It's where they play the Aerosmith song that became the big song, yes, you know, yeah. the Diane Warren song. It, it, it was number one was Animal Crackers scene in Armageddon. I made a ton of money, and J.J. Abrams and Jonathan Hensley get the credit for writing the worst scene <laughs> in, in, because again, they were the ones who got the final credit. So it's a win-win. So it can you. be a win-win. <laughs> exactly, it can, I guess, is, is, is my point. But a lot of times, it, it, it can't. Right. And then when the movie comes out really great, and you have no credit at all, then it sucks, because especially for like your, your friends like back home who don't even believe that you're like doing this anyway. And I'm like, no, dude, I wrote that. I'm like, oh, good, I'm gonna bring my kids to go see it. And then 
Uncle Scotty wrote it, and then, okay, where's Uncle Scotty's name? Right. And you can't, ex you can't explain the vagaries of the arbitration <laughs> process to, right. to your, you know, your friend. Or the script doctor thing. Drives a truck. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Although that's, I mean, that seems a tall order because you have to serve so many masters, you have to kind of cement the love story enough so when he leaves, she cries, the audience cries. When he returns, she's happy, they're happy. I think it all kind of comes from, mm -hmm. the audience bought that scene, certainly, and the use of the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, I mean, I, I didn't mention the second worst scene of the year was, was the leaving on a jet plane scene where he, they sing to her. I also wrote that one. So, you know. Well, the, the public had the last laugh. Exactly. Jerry had the last laugh. Jerry and Michael and the residuals. Do you write with an eye towards being commercial when you write, when you sit down to write something original? I mean, th I definitely have two tracks. I mean, I, I sit down sometimes and say, this is the greatest, biggest idea in the world, and, and this is so commercial. Um, and then there's basically every, it, I write always one script just for me, and they're really small, and they're really tiny, and in a perfect world that they'd be made for, you know, a few million dollars. Right. Um, but I always do them, most of them wind up on the shelf. Um, but it's a great way of, in, in, when I was first starting out, every time I'd finish a script, I'd write a short story, because I mean, fiction was, that's what I start, you know, did growing up and in college. Right. And so just to keep those skills sharp, I would write a short story, and then I just got like too lazy to, you know, to write a short story. It's, a, it's hard, it's actually harder than, you know. Short story uh, writing is harder than screenwriting? Yeah, for me it is, because that, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, my instrument's not sharp. Right. Um, and so now what I do instead is, is I'll finish, I, I honestly have like 10 to 12 like ideas for, unfortunately it used to be like, I, I used to have like 10 to 12 big commercial ideas and like two or three little ones. And uh, the older I get, like the big commercial <laughs> ones become less interesting. I have like 10 to 12, like it's like the cart, like in amazon.com <laughs> and I'm just waiting, you know, and I finish a script and I go and I try and, and do it and do them fairly quickly. But it's just, again, it's, it's, it keeps it pure. When did you first know you wanted to be a screenwriter? I, again, I was, I was the kid in like fifth grade when like if a teacher was leaving, like I would have to write the poem and read it to the assembly. Right. You know, I, I always, I, the only thing I could do was write. Okay. Um, and then, and I wrote fiction and I wrote fiction in college. And then it was one of those just weird coincidences where this, this girl that I was madly in love with who hated me was moving to California after college. And uh, I followed her out here. You chased her? I chased her. Stalking is my secret <laughs> to screenwriting. And, uh, and I was out here, and if you're out here and you write, eventually you're going to find your way to this thing called the screenplay. I always loved movies. I mean, I loved movies. But I just didn't know that you could actually do it. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it was different. Like, I grew up in Boston, and you just didn't know about screenwriters. And you right. didn't, you know, it, they didn't have the same sort of street cred as just novelists. And, you know, you didn't know. And I came out here and, and I was just, you, you can't help but be immersed in it. When did you first feel like you had what it takes to be a screenwriter? Did you have a moment where suddenly the confidence was there and you felt like you had broken through and you, you felt like I can do this for a living? I always had confidence as a writer. Okay. Um, and I just brought that, I just, oh, it was one of those, I, I foolishly have way too much confidence anyway. Like, it's just, it's the product of, um, um, you know, that overt parental Jewish love right. where we think we can do, you know, we break a window and our mother says, look at that window he broke. He's the greatest <laughs> window breaker of all time. Right. You know, it just carries over to, to, it informs everything that you do. But I just always felt it was the one area. I mean, it wasn't the one area, but it was the one area like I knew, like I sort of fake it with everything else from, you know, my driving skills to my lovemaking skills that I'm not so great at everything, but, but, you know, I pretend that I am. But at writing, I just always knew that I, I always knew that I, I could do it, you know, the, the, the fiction. Mm -hmm. And then it, just moving it over to the screenplay. And by the way, the other thing is you read other stuff. Right. And it's especially when, you're first, when you first arrive here and you're getting all these screenplays and you know, everybody you know is like a production assistant or working craft service or you know, when you're a freshman. And um, so you're reading all these scripts and, and most of them absolutely suck. And you're like, oh, I, can, I can do better than this. I can do that. Yeah, and then you're, you're, you're totally stoked. And then you read like Lethal Weapon or Usual Suspects, and they're like, ooh, not so much. Right. You know, so, so it's, it's that, I always say that there's, there's no, if I had to do it all over again, I would never have read any scripts. Because there's no, uh, the, the, all, these people that come out and, they, and they, they, they immediately get a job as like a reader for like somebody like you, I think that's the dumbest thing in the world. I mean, that's always my, my sort of, boilerplate advice because... Keep it to yourself because I need readers. <laughs> because, because A, if the scripts 
are rotten, which most of them are, you're totally annoyed because they somehow got to your boss, to you, mm -hmm. and, 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 and how did they? And then if they're brilliant, you're completely intimidated, and, and, and so it's like, it's a lose-lose situation. Had you written many unproduced specs before the first one got produced? I wrote exactly 10 scripts before I sold my first one, and then I sold my first one, and then it was my 14th that was things to do in Denver when you're dead. Not counting a couple of Tales from the Crypts okay. that we did. But yes, it was 14 scripts. That's why, you know, invariably, as I'm sure you do, I get those calls. My mother met your mother at a wedding. <laughs> I'm 22 years old, and I just graduated from Cornell. And I'm coming out there. I wrote a script, and uh, will you read it? Right. And I'm always like, how many have you written? And they were like, and they're like, uh, this is my first. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'll read it, dude, but I guarantee it's going to blow. Right. Because you're just learning. There's no way. I mean, I don't know how anybody can write. I mean, I go back and look at my, the first 10. Right. And they're horrible. I mean, there are little moments that are really great, which I cannibalize and put in Armageddon. Right. You know, <laughs> or, you know, you always can appropriate, put them somewhere. But overall, they're terrible because you're, you're learning to, you're learning your craft. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, because it's amazing how much it's changed even in the, in the you know, decade and a half since you and I first arrived. Right. Because now it's so front and center that you, you, know, you can come to Hollywood and you can make lots of money and you don't even have to have that much talent because it's happening all over the place. Right. Where it was right around when we had first arrived. Early 90s, late Early 80s. Early 90s, yeah. when it was just the whole Shane Black thing was just starting to happen. Right. And like, and that was sort of the beginning of it, but the big it wasn't spec script the big spec scripts. And you know, every every day you'd pick up a variety, and you know, some seventeen-year-old right. kid who'd never written a screenplay sold something for two million dollars, and like, only annoyed you more. Right. But 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 it wasn't. It was only there. It was very. And, and I mean, I guess it's just everybody's obsessed with the movie business and celebrity and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's it's only going to sort of in the internet and everything else. Right. It's just everybody's so hyper aware, you know, and it's crazy. Right. Um, so I. Th but I think that's actually served. Ill because people come here and this is not the place to be. You don't come here because you want to make money. Right. You come here. I mean, I'm sure everybody says that, but but it's really true. Right. It's, it's too not, hard. It's not like Wall Street where you, there's a set formula you can follow. If, and at least it's too you, hard. Right. You know, nobody says anybody who does is stupid. I, I'm going to go to Hollywood and get rich because I mean, again, the 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 chances of it happening are are slim. I mean, sure. the whole time when I was when I was first coming up, I remember like. Every time I go home, my uncle, one of my uncles, all of my uncles, they, we'd be at Thanksgiving or something. They'd go, hey, you know, it was just a thing in the New York Times. Do you know that it's harder to win? You have a better chance of winning the New York State lottery than selling a screenplay. You're like, thanks. Even the okay. uncle knows. Yeah, everybody, you know, but it really is. Right. And um, I mean, you, you got to do it because you absolutely, uh, as as sort of trite as it sounds, because you have no options. Right. This is what you love. This is what you want to do. How did you get familiar with the structure of a screenplay coming Just in? Just reading, reading scripts. Okay. Reading scripts and seeing movies. And I, I, did go to, I did go to the Hotshot Film School for a year. And where's that? That was actually, I actually went to all three of them. I, I say like there's only three. <laughs> but I went to like, I went to USC, UCLA, and NYU like really quickly. Um, I never graduated from any of them. Just kind of audited or really No, enrolled? no, I went. Okay. I went. I went to, you. I got into USC. Basically, I was here. I was here for like five years. I had no money. I was working every shit job, and I said, you know what, it's so, it was so like, all of a sudden, it was very demeaning. Not demeaning, but I felt like every single person was trying to do what I was trying to do. I remember the one contact I had was with this, with like a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who had written a sitcom like 20 years ago, and he had a meeting with me. He had this big, beautiful house in Beverly Hills, and he met me. I went up there, I was all nervous. <laughs> and uh, he said, so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a screenwriter. And he, he pointed to his gardener, who was like this Mexican guy, like mowing the lawn. He goes, so does he. I was like, oh God! <laughs> it's like the one thing everyone thinks they can do. Right, exactly. Well, it is because it's the only, you, it's the only thing you can do by yourself. You right. can't sort of act alone in a room, or you can't direct alone in a room. I right. mean, you can, but you're <laughs> crazy. your way, yeah. Right. So, so um, I, I was just feeling like I wasn't feeling special at all. So I was like, you know what? I'll apply to one of these. At least I'll be a, I'll be a guy driving a truck who's also going to USC Film School. Right. So I applied and I got in. And the one class that was amazing, unfortunately he's no longer with us, is, is it was this taught by this guy called Frank Danielle, who actually started the Columbia Film School with Milos Forman okay. back in the day. Frank Danielle? Frank Danielle. Mm -hmm. And he taught this course that he was this, he looked like Santa Claus. He was this lovely old, what's Milos Forman, Czech? 
Czech, yes, yeah, I so believe he's so. Also Czech. And he taught this course, and it's going to sound like it's the most boring course in the world, but everything I learned about structure, which is arguably not <laughs> much, was I learned in this one semester. He would show a movie, some like it hot, Sunset Boulevard, Casablanca. You'd watch it, big lecture hall. And then he'd show it again with the volume down really low, and he would basically tell you every, it was Oh, like, interesting, what we get on DVD commentary, he was doing live he was doing these classic live. films. Exactly, and it was all, that's where we learned about planting and payoffs and like all these things, and, 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 and it was unbelievable. And I mean, I, the, the truth of the matter is, I mean, I think you can either write dialogue or you can't. I don't think anybody can learn it. Um, Were you always good at it? And I, it yeah, I could do that, um, but you can learn, you can learn structure. You may not be great at it. Right. Um, but you can learn it, and I, I completely learned it, you know, in that in that class. Is there anything in your life that most prepared you to be a screenwriter? Being a Red Sox fan. Being a Red Sox fan. Hope springs eternal. Hope springs eternal. Yeah, right. because every time you write fade in, you think this time they're not going to fuck it up. Right. Like, it's the beginning of the time, season. It's, it's going to be great. And, right. and how do you continue now that they've won a world championship? Like, it's very difficult. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Yeah, but that, that's why. I'm, that's why I'm going into television. Right. How important is structure? to a screenplay, you know, do you break form at your own peril or how, how important is being true to that kind of like paradigm we, we all know I now? Think it's incredibly, I think it's incredibly important. I think that everything needs to have that three act structure. You can, I'm not into this whole, Danielle actually taught about you know, the, the importance of sequences within the structure and I think you can get a little bit overly didactic with all this stuff. But I don't think you know, each, I don't think the first act need, necessarily needs to have seven sequences or whatever right. it is. But you don't calculate down to the page. Not at all, not at all. But I do think, by the way, a perfect example. I mean, how can you? I, I would say to you that the first act of The Godfather ends when he shoots the cop in the, in the, in the, in right. the diner. Well, where is that, an hour into the movie? So, I mean, if you're looking at that, I mean, sure. imagine, give that to an executive and say, okay, my act one ends right. an hour into the movie. Right, or Robert Evans will tell you that he knew it was going to be a classic and he had to recut the movie and thank God for him. <laughs> is, it a, is it a matter of knowing the rules so you can throw them out when you need to? I mean, at the end of the day, like all the, every movie that works, you know, the act one, ha but again, you could say, I mean, Jaws, I could say act one, what, what, where's act one of Jaws? Right. I mean, who knows? I mean, you can make an argument that act one of Jaws is the minute that the sheriff, who's afraid of water, realizes there's a shark in the water, and that comes right. fairly early in right. the in the. In it's the, the Kittner boy, by the way. Yeah, it is the Kittner boy. Thank you. <laughs> But, but um, I'm just, I've asked this question before, but uh, I'm curious, do you think, why is the setup payoff thing so satisfying to an audience? Like why, if I'm sitting in a theater and I do go through a, a setup and then a later payoff, why is, why, why is that a built-in satisfying thing to an audience member? Because most of the time, I mean, I, I always think that the, the, best, the best setups are the ones that actually are telegraphed because I think an, audi an audience gets that supreme satisfaction if I knew that was gonna happen. I mean, nothing makes you happier than, I was doing it even before I was in this business. I'm the annoying guy who would lean over to my date and go, that guy, <laughs> celebrity's gonna slip him an onion, you know? And like, you, you want, because then there's that great satisfaction. That's a movie, it's, it's a shared experience, it's that thing. Whether you're commuting with your date or with the, the, the hero on the screen, you know? So I think there's, there's something to that. Right. Um, and then when you are surprised by it, I mean, I can't remember the last time I was honestly, truly, surprised in a movie because most of the time they're, they're spoiled for me by the time I get there. Right. It's either in the trailer or you've, you've been no, in the business, it's, you've it's, read the you script. Know, I'm you on know. the way to see the, the, the Night Shyamalan movie and, and the, first, the Bruce Willis one. Right, Sixth Sense. And yes, I'm going to see Sixth Sense and, and like a week, a week before I was going to see it or two days before, you know, one of my buddies goes, it's very Jacob's Ladder. And I was like, oh, dude. Like, like I knew. He right. just, he didn't give, I didn't give it away. I gave nothing away. It's like, yeah, you did. Now I can figure it out. Right. You know, it's like that kind of thing. I cannot remember the last time I was truly, truly surprised. I'm not saying that I'm so brilliant. Sure. I'm just saying, I don't know right. where the... But it's uh, a good thing if you can surprise people. Absolutely.